I recently had the chance to talk with Ron Sutherland, chief scientist at the Wildlands Network, about the critically endangered red wolf population of North Carolina, the ongoing wolf restoration project at Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, and the environmental impacts of red wolves. Ron is an advocate for wolf conservation and currently directs a camera trap project monitoring the population of red wolves in the Alligator River and Pocosin National Wildlife Refuge areas in North Carolina. Ron, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, let's let's transition and talk about your work with the wildlands and the, the red wolves in North Carolina. As far as we know, the red wolf was the, the original wolf of the, of the southeast. Mm -hmm. And you know, early explorers that got here, um, Bartram and, and others, saw wolves. And they weren't always red. In fact, there was in Florida and on the Atlantic side, they were often more of a blackish color. Um, but there definitely were wolves. There were, there's records of county of sort of colonial, you know, British-run colonies paying paying bounties for people to shoot the wolves, unfortunately. And um, you know, the European settlers, when they arrived, kind of started eradicating them more or less as fast as they could. The wolves held on, though, till around 1900 in most of the eastern states. And then finally, the, the, the level of deforestation and the level of, of uh, defaunization, if that's a word, um, got to be too extreme. Like, you know, a lot of people don't, don't know that around 1900, deer were practically an endangered species in a lot of the East Coast because we had overhunted deer, which is really, really hard to believe now. <laughs> it uh, is. I mean, you know, many everywhere. years later. Yeah, deer, deer. Definitely have rebounded, um, but yeah, we, we basically got rid of all the places where the wolves could could hide, and we got rid of a lot of their food, and that was ultimately too much, um, and they, the populations collapsed. And so they decided they made the ultimate decision that they were going to catch the wolves that were out there, and that they could find and bring them into captivity. Um, same thing that later happened with the uh, California condor, and eventually with the, the black-footed ferret. Um, so they, they basically drove the species extinct in the wild on purpose and ended up with, I think, 17 red wolves whose, whose offspring in captivity seemed to look also like them. That was how they sort of verified these were wolves. And actually, it was only, only 14 wolves were able to breed. And so, so the, the current red wolf population is officially all descendants of those 14 animals, which is, from a biological standpoint, not good because <laughs> that was a huge, huge reduction in genetic diversity. And by 1987, they had enough wolves in captivity to start thinking about reintroduction. Um, 1984, Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge was, was sort of created in part with the idea that it could be a good place for the wolves. And the reason they chose it for the wolves was that it was far enough away from the swarm of coyotes that were moving east that they thought they could buy the wolves several decades to sort of recover their um, and so they, the first wolf, I think they started with eight, eight wolves in 1987, and the population kind of grew from there. And then 2010, 2012, the politics in North Carolina changed, and the Wildlife Commission kind of, I don't know, they, they were heavily influenced by this one real estate developer who lived down there who turned out to hate the Red Wolf program for no obvious reason. And um, but he was he was fairly wealthy and fairly charismatic and and persistent. And he was able to convince the southeast region of the Fish and Wildlife Service and also the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, the state wildlife agency, that the Red Wolf program had gotten out of hand and that it needed to be reined in. And so things kind of collapsed after that <laughs> and the population went way down. Um, people started shooting them more because this guy was spreading this rumor that the wolves were eating all the deer essentially, and causing, in his words, the greatest wildlife disaster in the history of North Carolina, which is ex <laughs> quite an exaggeration. If you think about the history of what had just happened, you know, 100 years before, we, we wiped out all the forests and mm -hmm. got rid of all the wildlife and drove the ivory, ivory bill woodpeckers extinct and all that, all that kind of stuff, and the, the wolves extinct. You know, the wolves had been sort of loosely tolerated, and then suddenly they were not tolerated, and people started shooting them. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the the federal government kind of lost interest in the wolf program. Um, and in, in 2015, they stopped doing the coyote management. They stopped releasing wolves from captivity right at the same time as the population was collapsing. And that, that led to the, the red wolf population nosediving 
And by 2020, uh, it was down, I think late 2020, it was down to seven confirmed animals with radio collars. So I'm really curious about your, uh, the program of uh, running the camera traps and, you know, tracking populations in Alligator River, in Pocosin Lakes, not just of red wolves, but other species too. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, going back to where we were, like the, we had this, this red wolf opponent guy spreading the rumor that the red wolves were eating all the other wildlife. And we decided to sort of, to treat that as a testable hypothesis. Um, and we were pretty sure it was false, but we wanted to, to show that. And so in 2015, we got a small grant to put out these, these trail cameras, as they're called now, um, at both Alligator River and Pocosin Lakes, and then eventually some tracts of private land too. And these cameras are you know, these little little gray boxes that um, they have a motion sensor that activates when a warm-blooded creature goes in front of the camera. They sort of self self actuate, and and then they um, they have two different types of. Well, actually, they, the modern ones they used to just have a, a bright white flash, which of course results in a lot of pictures of scared animals. And now now they actually use a uh, infrared flash that humans can't even see. And so we we had cameras up. Um, at Alligator River from 2015 to 2022, and Pocosin Lakes, we still have cameras up um, out there, and we've we've been trying to to see what's going on in places that have the wolves, what's going on with the other wildlife, mm -hmm. and we just published a paper uh, last fall about um, the first seven years of the research, and sort of you know when we set out to do the project, of course we were trying to stop the red wolf from from declining and being shot out of existence. Um, unfortunately, the red wolf population did keep declining from 2015 to 2020. And so a lot of what we were able to show is sort of what, what's going on with other wildlife as the red wolf population decreases uh, over that time. Um, they held on at Alligator River the longest um, because that population is very well protected. But eventually that, that the wolves, even the wolves at Alligator River, the breeding pair, one of the 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 breeding male of that pack eventually died of old age and there was no unrelated male to come in and and salvage that population yeah so what, what we found was evidence that certain species that the wolves preyed on like raccoons and possums they actually went up in detection which made sense um when the wolves when, as the wolves went down uh the deer population was a bit you know, you know First of all, the big point we wanted to make and we were able to make it was that everywhere we put cameras up, there were deer and oftentimes lots of deer. <laughs> and so the idea that the wolves had sort of eradicated the deer population was, we were able to show that wasn't true. Um, and there was no clear, directly clear signal that as the wolves went down, the deer went up. They sort of did and then they went down again. Mm. And yeah, you know, we weren't expecting, because this is a wild population and ecology being what it is, results are usually pretty messy in ecology. The bear population detection rates kept going up during our study. I tend to think that was, it's just the bears are still um, still recovering themselves. Uh, and they, they have reached pretty incredible densities out there. If you ever want to see bears, <laughs> the Alligator River is a, it's a great place to do it. We've seen 42 bears in a day and a half <laughs> and trying really hard not to double count um, the same bear, <laughs> you know. Um, and a lot of those were, you know, mother bears with cubs and things. Bobcats, maybe, because red wolves and bobcats eat a lot of the same smaller prey items. Mm -hmm. So maybe as the wolves kind of vacated some areas, the bobcats may have had an easier time. The, the bobcat detection rates did go up during our study, which is pretty interesting. What we'd like to be able to do, now the red wolf population is rebounding, and the you know, Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is reinvesting in the program, releasing more wolves from captivity, finally. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to be out there documenting what happens to the, all the other wildlife as the wolf population increases again. Is the population of quail one that you're interested in uh, kind of seeing what happens with, with that bird? We were out there doing the cameras and in the summers we would hear quail calling all over the place. And quail, bobwhite quail, are a species that has been declining for decades all across the southeast. And yet here we are, you know, we're out there in this, these big fields at, at, at Alligator River and the quail were just everywhere. And so we decided to sort of try to document that and compare it to the, the wolf detections and also things like um, raccoons and possums that are nest predators and they're called mesopredators because they're medium sized. And those, 
the yeah, you know, the wolves actually do eat the the raccoons and maybe to a lesser extent the possums. I don't know. Very many things like to eat possum, but opossums. But anyways, the um, we had this theory that that maybe the wolves were actually protecting the quail populations. So we did two summers worth of quail surveys at the same places we had our cameras, and we're finally getting enough the data all analyzed. We had the quail data is ready, but the um, the camera data is taking forever because we actually we jumped up to the number of cameras. Um, we had like fifty cameras out in twenty twenty one taking, you know, thousands and thousands of pictures each. And so <laughs> it's taking a while to get through all that. But I think we're actually pretty close. I'm hoping to have some answers um, this later this year. But at the very least, we can say that an area with a, um, the area where the wolves have been since 1987 has very abundant quail populations. Like the, our land terms were counting um, basically about as many quail calling in a five minute period as they could actually distinguish. <laughs> if we're able to show that yeah, lo and behold, the red wolf, through its sort of top carnivore role, was actually probably was playing a historical role in protecting ground nesting birds like quail, like wild turkey, and that, that maybe by returning red wolves to other parts of the southeast, we could actually boost this really popular game bird, the quail. I think that it has the potential to, to be sort of a game changer for how, how land managers look at red wolf restoration. If you want to learn more about red wolves, I've included links to Ron's profile page at the Wildlands and a link to the Wolf Storyline unit I wrote for my AP Biology classes. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this helpful.